Sorry. I will be talking for the most part about proofs uh, of sequential work and then towards the end I will talk a bit about its reversibility and its added value. We could also start by talking about proofs of work. These are non-interactive proof systems at the end of which the verifier gets convinced that the prover did some t computational steps. They're very famous these days and are a very simple instantiation of that. If you have a random oracle, you keep repeatedly looking for uh, assault until it, the hash starts with uh, enough zeros. Um, and this, uh, this kind of construction, very simple, but it's very highly parallelizable. You could do this step in totally in parallel. So if you care about, if the verifier cares about the sequentiality of the work, then we come into the concept of proofs of sequential work. And it's uh, an interactive proof system where in the end the proof approves T sequential steps, not merely T steps. And the way to formalize it is that you assume, okay, even given a massively parallel adversary that tries to save a bit on sequentiality, it will fail with overwhelming probability. Uh, why we care about proofs of sequential work? They had many applications, old applications and new. The motivation for our work was uh, some application that we wanted to do for cryptocurrencies. I will sketch that uh, towards the end. But in all of these applications, you can think of it, you, you use the computation and delays to kind of think about time in real life. And that's the main uh, idea in the, all these applications. So if that's the only thing that we cared about, this kind of semi-definition that I gave, then there's a trivial solution. <coughs> you get an x and you uh, apply f to get x1, again x2 until you get xt, and you send this back, and if f is random oracle, this is highly sequential. Great. But the problem is the prover is useless to the verifier. The verifier, to be convinced, has to do all the work again. So obviously we, we care about something else, not only sequentiality, we need to have some gap in the, in the work between the prover and the verifier. So if we are already on this slide, we can observe the following. If we have a, a random permutation f, such that if we apply it in the backward direction, it's much faster, then the verifier could also do the verification in the backward direction. So the prover proves in the forward direction, the verifier in the backward direction. It depends on how much uh, gap uh, is there between the <coughs> evaluation, the forward and the backward of f, we could have something practically relevant. An instantiation of this idea was defined by this last function, uh, <coughs> which is a carefully defined square root permutation of the multiplicative group of a finite field of, uh, of size p. We don't care much about the, the technical details here, except that in the forward, it's essentially computing square roots. In the, in the backward direction, it's one squaring. Um, and the assumptions that computing square roots in such, in such groups takes uh, roughly log p sequential squarings. And if that's the case, then we can, the verify would, would gain this gap. Uh, in, it verifies in the backward direction, and it has a log p speed up. Log p in, in practice would be uh, probably a thousand. It's great. It's not, uh, and they actually use this function to use uh, to do interesting stuff. But this is not the, the fi the, what we actually hope for. We hope to have some verification that the verification time will be something bully logarithmic, and still relevant in practice, and we can actually use it and deploy it. Before we go to the, the practical things, we could also somebody would say, well, if you had already a sequential function like a hash chain you could just compute the result and throw a snark on it. That's great, the, the proof is small, the verifier can verify it quickly, but now the prover is not happy. It has to do an extra work to generate this, this proof, and this uh, thing in its generality is, is not that practical. It can be depending on what kind of functions and what kind of snarks you use, but it, in its generality it's not uh, clear that you can actually use it in practice. So we will not follow this, uh, this approach, and instead we will follow the approach <coughs> of Mahmoudi Moran Vadan and <coughs> in this approach, the protocol will be parameterized by a graph. I'll talk about what kind of graphs uh, these are. And, and here the, the, the prover will actually use uh, some random oracle and the statement. To, to label this, uh, this graph in the most natural way, where the label of, of a node uh, is a function of the label of its parent. You do the labeling of the graph, 
you Merkle tree commit to it, you send the commitment to the verifier, then the verifier would like to see that you actually did the right thing and will start uh, in, uh, quizzing you on some, some labels. May I ask you, give me this. You will give the, <coughs> the labels of the parents. Then you can verify the correctness uh, of the label. And you also give the Merkle tree commitment of everything that you already opened. This is a small example. You are giving almost all the graph, but this is just for illustration. And, uh, and this can be verified uh, quickly, and you can repeat this many times until the verifier is, is convinced. Well, great, but so far, <laughs> where is the sequentiality of work? There's no sequentiality here. Well, this comes, boils down to the kind of graphs that you're using. And in their instantiation, they use graphs called uh, ED diphthrobus graphs. It's not very important to know what they are, but they're very simple to explain, so we, we can still do it. These graphs are graphs in which if you take E nodes out of the graph, then, then the induced graph, the remaining graph, has a path of length D. So, and they're actually very good uh, graphs with very good parameters, where you have theta in the size of the graph. The size of the graph will be also T. Uh, theta, theta, so great. <coughs> and the, these have also Boolean logarithmic uh, in degree. The problem with these graphs in terms of, of in application is that the prover needs prohibitively large space in order to compute the labels of this graph for almost all of the time. If it's going to do it in t steps, it's going to maintain a lot of space in its memory, and that's not what we want. But is the question that was raised in this paper, is that necessary? Uh, well, it turns out it's not. With a construction, we use the different graphs by Cohen Piatchak. If you're going to commit anyway, so let's start with the Merkle tree commitment and, uh, and make a good graph out of that. So you start with a graph like this, and you add some extra carefully crafted edges that uh, their purpose will become clear why. And this is, will become your graph. And as before, you label the graph. But interestingly, you do the, la the labeling itself is also a commitment. So once you label the sync, you already commit it to the graph. So you do these two things in one shot elegantly and nicely, and then in this case also you don't need to maintain large space to actually compute uh, the label, so it's very, very good. And just as a sanity check, I'm not going to give the proof for this, observe that there's a path that passes through all the nodes of the graph, and that's by design you added these extra, extra edges. So at least the sanity check passes, there's a long path, you can hash, uh, use a hash function, and then you get stuff. And as before, so this is the first phase, kind of the commitment phase. The second phase is, as before, uh, challenge response phase. <coughs> it can be done in the, in the natural way. So good. So, so far, this is practical and nice and good. What are we doing here? And so this is also enough for our previous work, and let's talk about the current work. We want to, talk, we want to have a construction that's as simple as a skip list. I will talk about it in a second. Uh, the construction is very simple to explain, and it's as if almost as efficient uh, as the previous uh, construction. And on top of that, it has this nice feature of reversibility that we can see it actually gives us an added value in these proofs of sequential work. So let's start with it. <coughs> the, same, the same approach, but here we look at the labeling in a different way. We have uh, this as kiblist is part of the parameter of, uh, of, uh, of the proof system, and we use X to sample a bunch of permutations. Don't try to parse this, it's unnecessary. These permutations, you can think of them, you put them in these boxes, and now you think of this as the circuit computing, as a circuit to compute, uh, you know, the, get an input here and you compute the output there. So you start with the zero input. Each wire here it will be a W bits. Say for this uh, permutation, you have three, three wires, each of W bits, you apply the permutation, you get the output, and so on. For this one, you take the first wire and you move the next ones. So you apply the zero input to it until one step at a time, until you reach the end, and you define this as your label and your commitment, and you send it to the verifier. So this is the first phase. The second phase, as before, you get uh, some challenges and you need to open them. Here, the, the challenge for the illustration, assume the challenge is I5, which would be here. I will think of this, okay, I will, would want to find the path that starts at the, uh, at the beginning, at the, at the source, and it ends at the sink, and passes through five. This looks like a very long path, but it's actually logarithmic in the size of, of the skip list. 
And what we do, we then you give the corresponding states. These are the, the states that we computed. You give them back to the verifier. The verifier would like to check the consistency of, uh, of this in a, in a most natural way. Uh, and <coughs> observe that these are permutations, and these are invertible permutations. They will be random permutations. We're here in the random permutation model. And then you can also verify in the backward. You have the last state. You invert it here, and you see in these blue, blue nodes, if the input here is an output here, consistent, the input here is output here, consistent, and so on. So you, prove, you, you check the consistency one at a time until you do it. Uh, this is a logarithmic, a uh, path of logarithmic length. You can do this efficiently, repeat this enough many times, and you get conviction that uh, the prover is doing the right thing, and there's a path that we will see that this gives us a proof of sequential work. And notice the space. When you're computing this, you only need to maintain one, uh, you know, well, of course, the description of uh, the parameters, but also just one state. From sigma i, you can go to sigma i plus one. And also, interestingly, from sigma i plus one, you can go to sigma i, which is the reversibility and which is going to turn out to be useful, actually. Um, so the theorem statement that we prove is that uh, the prover will run in two stages. In the first stage, this is the, in the commitment phase, and then <coughs> the second stage is in the challenge response phase. And we say if the proof in the first phase done one minus alpha t sequential steps rather than t sequential steps, and in total uh, queries, sorry to the rest of the permutations, and in total it, it did q queries, then it will make the verifier accept with this probability. The first term <coughs> comes from uh, a collision uh, in some collision event on these permutations. If that did not happen, then the, the only thing, then the verifier, the prover can succeed only on one minus alpha fraction that corresponds to the sequential work that is done. A uh, highlight of how these proofs actually work, a very high hand wavy sketch, is that you run the prover, you observe its queries, and in this case, I'm thinking of these nodes as, as query x and y, uh, input and output to the query. Uh, whether it's in the forward direction or the backward direction, we don't care about that at the moment. And then you add an edge between, say, two nodes if they are consistent, meaning if the output here is an input here, you add an edge, otherwise you don't. Uh, it's obvious that we do this because of the verification, how the verification actually works. And then you also do pruning of this graph. You, you chop all the nodes that are useless for the adversary, and it won't affect its success probability. So here we are assuming that the bad event did not happen and collisions uh, uh, that verse I could not say find some collision. So this will be useless. Uh, so and observe in what remains is that there is a path that goes through all the nodes of the graph. And we apply uh, random permutation, so there's the sequentiality follows. Uh, and we also observe that the only challenges on which the adversary succeeds are the nodes in the black graph, the one that uh, remained after pruning. Oh, apparently I'm very fast. Okay, very good. So, so in concluding, so if we look at what we looked at, so the, the hash chain takes, in order to verify sequentiality, takes these steps. You redo the computation. The sloth function gained uh, a log p factor, in practice, great. The, the trees uh, of Cohen and Piaget, they log t. In the construction that I showed, it's actually not log square t, it's log t. But to be fair, the input to the queries here compared to this are larger. So in the worst case, there could be the input could be of, uh, of size log t. And that's why, to be fair, comparing this to that, we added the log, log squared. Uh, the assumptions is ra random oracles, random permutations, and the sequentiality and computed repeated squaring. So that's great if it comes only for sequentiality. But sometimes, in some of the applications, you care about the correctness of the computation. <coughs> and I'll sketch it in a second. Um, and when it comes, if you care about the correctness rather than only sequentiality, then all of a sudden, these best uh, schemes have worse parameters. You have to, to recompute the whole thing uh, to be convinced that the output is, is correct, while still the slot function is still the best of these. Why is that? Uh, this is, if you just recall the graphs that I was showing before, in all of them, if you've done the actual sequential work and you decide to cheat, say, on one node, hmm, then you will pass the, the verification of sequentiality with overwhelming probability, but uh, 
but the output is not correct. Uh, so they're malleable. All of these are malleable, and that's why to verify correctness, you need to actually redo the whole computation. The question was, because we were motivated by an application to, to cryptocurrencies, where we want to retain the bit in, in the Chia network, you want to retain, <coughs> these are the um, cryptocurrency bits and proof of space, you want to retain the dynamics of bitcoins, Bitcoin in terms of, the, of every few minutes you need a new block without uh, assuming synchrony. And you, you would like that some uh, party will do this sequential computation that takes time. Everyone else just observes and verifies the correctness. So only one party can do this computation. It's deterministic and everybody can verify it quickly. That would be great. And that will, uh, you know, this is kind of uh, on a high level how uh, this will be used in, in Chia. And for that, you care about uh, correctness. So the best that we could do, given this image, which will change in a second drastically, is that we could take the best of both worlds. We could also take, you know, sequentiality, we, we stay here, but also we would like to kind of have the sloth function and take the, the speed up, the practical speed up that it gives us in, in a construction like what I called here sloth skip list. And this is actually the main design criteria why we uh, avoided random oracles and we ended up using permutations because we wanted to embed such a function in the computation uh, such that we ca can gain speed up. So in this case, the, the verifier, the computation will be done in the backward and it will be much faster. It's just you plug it in and it just looks like that. You don't need to parse it, but you just really plug these uh, permutations on the lower level of this. And then correctness will be verified in the backward and you get a log B factor. A thousand in practice is not bad. Uh, still, in theory, you, you would like this verification to be, to be quick. And subsequent and concurrent to this work, there's a line of beautiful work about uh, verifiable delay functions where you could think of them as, as proofs of sequential work that have unique, uh, unique output and you verify sequentiality and correctness in one shot and there are schemes that you can actually verify that in constant time. There are caveats to that. You have to do the, the, the proof generation may take a bit long and so on. So there are different, uh, different proposals here. Uh, <coughs> I won't uh, cover them from different uh, assumptions. Uh, and they add extra properties. So it's very interesting and exciting area. One major open problem in this area is uh, post quantum security. Uh, I think I will leave it at that and thank you very much. Are there any questions? All right. In, in your list of uh, previous works, you didn't mention number theoretic solutions, which seem to be uh, uh, very efficient. Th there is a suggestion long ago uh, of uh, calculating 2 to the 2 to the t uh, modulo n n, which whose factorization is known to the verifier. Yeah. So it gives you an exponential gap and a uh, very easy way to verify correctness and has all the nice properties, but it doesn't, uh, uh, it has to assume that uh, um, factoring is difficult. But and, and, uh, the and, and uh, you know, there's also it's not public coin, right? In the sense, the verifier, to verify the correctness, you can compute. So, okay. No, so there's no public coin, as far as I can see. Uh, you just calculate two to the two to the time you want. The uh, uh, prover is just repeatedly squaring modulo n. And the verifier, knowing the factorization, can quickly calculate the... Uh, um, the root. Exactly. If the verifier knows the factorization, if you care about designated verifier, that's brilliant. Yes. And that's actually these two works, Piatchak and Veselovsky, take that beautiful construction and make it public, such that anybody, without knowing the, the, the trapdoor, so can actually verify. And these are actually two elegant and concurrent work that okay. does didn't exactly that. didn't mention this as an extra requirement. I was thinking about one prover, one verifier, and then I didn't see the difference. Yeah, Thanks. true. Thank you. Uh, hey. I had a question. So, wh what fails if you take the uh, Cohen Pietzak construction and just use a, use the sloth permutation on the lowest level? Sorry again. If I so, use why can I just take the 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 this? Uh, the the Pietzak uh, the Cohen Pietzak uh, construction and just use a use a permutation on sort of the lowest level or connecting the leaves of the tree? to get the same uh, O of n steps of verification, but just have a 
the log T proof size. So you want to put them here? Yeah, just connect the leaves uh, with a... So, well, you're talking about radically different constructions. So first of all, let's uh, observe that this is not reverse ablet all. It uses a uh, hash function and, and, uh, and hashes things down, so you cannot hope to reverse it. Uh, so you're saying, well, I don't care about that, so why don't you talk about this line? It's not clear how to do the proof in that construction at all in that, uh, in that scenario. It's a very different construction, but by definition, it doesn't work. This is just hashing down. You lose, you cannot reverse it. Any other questions? Yeah. Do, so we have to trust, uh, so the, the permutations will be chosen with every proof by the, by the prover, the permutations. Um, the, the permutations are, uh, are random permutations and invertible. So we don't, but, there's no but, secret information in it. But so how do, do, is it important that they are random? So and how, do we, how do we trust that they are random? I mean, I well, guess. if you trust AES, for example, probably you could do that. You know, in practice, you probably use something like AES and assume it's, it's a random permutation. It's but invertible. Be, you don't care about uh, uh, trapdoors. That's what you actually use. So in the end, you use uh, uh, so this X will will be will have some enough uh, entropy to kind of sample different permutations, and there there's, there are no trapdoors. And when you try to make the verifier uh, efficient, so it like in the picture you showed, it looked like it's still in in terms of n the length. Like in, if, so, yeah. somehow is there some compression going on? Because you saw you you showed like this row operators. Can you show the the verifier, the log n? You're like talking about the the correctness. Yes, when you verify the correctness. Yes. So yes, it looks like it's still. It, I don't see where the the dimension disappears because you just add those rows. So. I don't see where you cut, how, why, why it becomes n over log n rather than n. Yeah, because, because by definition, these permutations, if you apply it in the forward direction, okay, so you as a prover, you, have, you, you cannot start from the end. You don't know the end. You start from the start where you know. And you, start, you, you apply the square root once, and if you assume that this operation takes log p, sequential squarings, it's clear that if the, if the, the verifier in the end can go in the backward, and it will be here, oh, how do you verify that something is square root? You just square it, it's just one operation. So there's this log b gap. I mean, it's still just a constant. It's not, uh, you know, like sequentiality, but. All right, let's uh, thank the speaker again.